maybe should have done it when I was in college. It took me a long time to figure this out. Um, but I used to do so much extracurricular that actually didn't impact me to be a better person. And so I want people to be genuine to who they are. And again, my, my core values are taking care of my family, stability financially, whatever it is, winning basketball games, because if you win basketball games, I'm taking care of my family long term um, because I'll always have a job and three your faith. Um, and again, you know, I'm a faith person. I work at a Christian university. And I get to talk about faith every day. You know, faith is whatever you want it to be. You know, I'm I, I love people. And I love who people are. Welcome and to Beyond the Ball Podcast. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on, ballers? Welcome to another episode of the Beyond the Ball Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Jones, and as you all know, we find the most interesting people just around the world, uh, and we focus on stories, strategies, and successes, ultimately to help student-athletes succeed beyond their degree, and just as we're encroaching, encroaching in and just as we're you know, getting ready to continue to not only educate student-athletes, but inform them, but setting them up for life. I thought that this gentleman would be a great guest to, to bring on to the platform. So I, I want to welcome my, my former teammate, right? My former teammate. Um, now, now he's doing he's doing great things, uh, working with the ACU women's basketball program, amongst so many other things. But welcome to the Beyond the Ball podcast, Coach Eric DeRue. What's, what's going on, Coach DeRue? What's good, bro? Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, man, de definitely, definitely. So re really quick, I, I want to kick the mic to you and give you a second just to uh, give the people like a little bit of snapshot, a little bit about you and, you know, just just what you do. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously, before I get into all of it, Coach Jonathan, I call you Coach, Jonathan Jones and I were, were teammates at the University of Texas at Tyler. That was that was our very first connection. Um, from there, uh, I transferred to a small school up in Kansas. And then from that, I got a graduate assistant job at Fresno State University where I was women's basketball at GA. And from there, I hopped on to be an assistant coach here at Abilene Christian. I'm starting my sixth year here at ACU. I coach women's basketball. Uh, to be honest with you, I'll hit that on the head. Like, I played, obviously, men's college basketball. I get asked all the time why I picked women's basketball. When I watch the women's game, it's so much how I play, below the rim, to be honest with you. Uh, I never dunked a basketball in my life, um, or at least not legitimately. Um, <laughs> but, like, in most female athletes have not, and that's okay. And I realized that. I could relate with a female basketball player so much better than I could with a male basketball player at the highest level. And so that's why I attacked women's basketball the way that I did and went all in um, from an early part of, of my career. Um, again, my sixth year here at ACU, uh, I love every bit about of it. Um, Abilene, Texas is incredible, incredible community. Um, I have a beautiful wife and a two-year-old daughter. And to be able to coach Division One basketball in a great community um, is kind of a dream of mine. I mean, I get to live it every single day. So why change um, what's what's working? Uh, we've been very successful, been very fortunate to be a part of a great staff and a great program. Uh, my first year here, we won a conference championship. Um, year three, maybe, we went to the NCAA tournament. Uh, it's just been incredible opportunities I had basketball-wise to travel the country, to travel the world, um, coaching college basketball. Uh, outside of basketball, I love TikTok. Uh, I think it's one of the, the greatest generational social medias that we have access to. Um, I was late to the game on Twitter, but I was early enough on the game on TikTok to actually get an understanding of it and have my own, my own niche. Um, so the way I promote myself on TikTok is talk about basketball and recruiting. And what I realized through my own recruiting process is that I never really understood recruiting. My parents didn't play sports. I loved basketball for my own personal reasons. And they had no idea how to help me get to play college basketball. And I had no one that actually helped me. I just figured it out myself. And, I, you know, I probably played at the right levels. I was never great at basketball. I was a good high school basketball player. And that probably gets you to D3 NAI basketball, to be honest with you. Um, but I always realized that if I didn't know how to get recruited in that process, there's probably thousands of kids that don't understand it. And once I got to Division One basketball, college coaches, for whatever reasons, keep everything close to the chest. And I never understood that. There's no reason I can't tell you what I'm looking for in a player. There's no reason I can't tell you how many scholarships I have and why I can only use certain scholarships on what. Um, so that was my initial like use of TikTok was how can I share the information that I have that I used that I would have loved to have when I was 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old going through the basketball process and recruiting. So that's where it all started. Um, so obviously, Coach Sergio on basketball, lover of TikTok for a lot of different reasons. Uh, but again, thanks for having me. 
Yeah. Well, I I never I never knew that, Daru. I never knew that 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 for for one that you know that you had to take re recruiting into your own hands because I mean you know just going back like you said earlier we we are you know teammates and going back to UT Tyler and I I remember you just seeing you shoot man you. Yeah. Hey, you, hey, you used to get the shots up. You got the shots up. You had a night. You had a nice stroke. But I, but I had no idea that you had to take up recruiting on your own. So, like, looking back, if if you were just back in back in time, back in your old shoes, and like, just walk me through like what you felt like after you you know where now it's time for you to transfer out or now you're looking for the next opportunity. Like, just 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 walk walk us through that, man. Through the high school process or when I was at UCLA? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk, talk about the high school, high school process. Yeah. yeah. So, like, obviously, I loved basketball. That's all I really cared about, to be honest with you. Um, if I didn't play college basketball, I'm not sure I would have went to college. Not because I wasn't smart or whatever. I just didn't really care for school. Um, and that's probably something saying something who works in a college right now. Um, but in high school, you know, I loved basketball. But, like, no one in front of me in my high school really played at high level. And so, I, like, we weren't having college coaches roll in every day. So, like, that wasn't the norm. And there wasn't consistent AAU basketball um, in East Texas at the time. There was one team when I was a freshman in high school that was only for 17 U, so, like, the oldest high school seniors. And that mm -hmm. folded before I even got to my age. So, there was not one team in East Texas that was playing competitive AAU basketball. So, there, like there was no market, there was no one recruiting high school players to play AAU. And so I had to find an AAU team out of Dallas. And like at the time, like I, at that point, Twitter wasn't around yet. I mean, I'm not aging myself too much, but like Twitter wasn't a big thing. And so right now, any high school prospect or any high school athlete is either getting recruited to, to an AAU team or could find an AAU team in their, in their region within seconds on Google or Twitter. Uh -huh. It wasn't as accessible when I was a sophomore or junior in high school. So I didn't play AAU select basketball until the end of my junior year going into my senior year. So I only played one year of AAU basketball. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned through the recruiting process on being a divisional basketball coach is so much of the evaluation and getting on a coach's recruiting list happens so far in advance. Um, you know, the men, obviously I coach women's basketball. So we recruit at a super young age, a young age as in like, We've offered eighth graders before, and it does like we don't we don't even bat eyes. Um, eighth mm -hmm. graders, you know, haven't played freshman, you know, varsity yet. Um, you know, we have I can't say this too loudly, but like have commitments in younger age brackets that like players that haven't even started the recruiting process. So we can't even recruit certain players because we have commitments so young. Um, wow. you, know, as a, you know, again, Division three NAI doesn't work as early, but for me, not understanding the recruiting process and or not having availability to play AAU basketball, I think hindered my overall options as a college basketball player again like i wasn't okay i guess better than most because obviously you and i both play college basketball so mm -hmm. i was dumb down how good i was um I, I was good for high school in my region but what i realized is i probably could have had more options if i played aau basketball sooner but again i didn't know my parents didn't know i didn't have access to teams so that's something that i would have done earlier and sooner again the what i tell players now and that i didn't have access to then is obviously like the traditional emailing college coaches and, and filling out recruiting questionnaires is all great and whatnot. But I get a hundred emails a day from kids that I'll never recruit. And at this point, I, I don't even open 90% of them. Um, I just get so many from yeah. kids all over the country that aren't really caring about ACU. They're just sending to the masses. What I tell players all the time is to DM me on Twitter because what I realize is I delete emails every day. I've never deleted a DM straight mm. up. And, and I, I say that, Honestly, in transparency, is I've read every DM. At some, at some point in my life, that'll probably phase out. But as of right now, Twitter and I guess Instagram to some extent have some type of grasp on me where it's not as professional and becomes more personal because you found me. It's, it's way harder to spam somebody on Twitter than it is on an email. Mm, man. Wow. Wow. So you delete, delete. What? I never even would have thought about that. Just, you know, that just the aspect of, if somebody's looking to get recruited, seeing about DMing, because just like you're saying, these things are in our hands 90% of the day, right? And when we go to sleep, a lot of times it's just right there on the nightstand. So, dang. Huh. And when, when I look at when I look at emails, like I'm I'm expecting like something professional from a colleague, from like I, I just you people view emails as different entity than Twitter and Instagram. And when I'm on Twitter and, and Instagram, I'm, I'm thinking differently. And for me as a college coach, 90% of my feed is basketball. 
And so I'm used to seeing that with my emails. Like I feel like I have to be too professional and or like people are sending me stuff on emails. That's I feel like their parents are writing or somebody that they paid is writing for them. It's just not how I like to build relationships and or recruit or find players. Gotcha. 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 Yeah. So speak. So speaking about building relationships uh, with, with you getting into like getting into the position to where you are now, to where you're a division one, like you're a division one college coach. Yeah. Can, can you just talk about how how you learned how to get into the room? Because uh, people even reach out to me. People re- reach out to me every once in a while, coach. And they're like, hey, I'm, I'm looking to get involved in getting into athlete, athletics. And I'm like, I don't I don't necessarily work in athletics. Right. So I, w- I want to ask you, like, if there's an up and coming coach or there's an aspiring coach and they're looking to, you know, find their footing in this space, what, what would you tell that person? Yeah. You know, obviously, I'll, I'll tell my story briefly after this. But what I've realized is people in the college sports world hire who they know first and then they hire who they trust in that same kind of, you know, footing. Mm-hmm. And the third piece, if they don't have one of those two things, they hire who their best friend knows and trusts. So like there's oh, like a wow. small connection. Right. And then if they're either they can't pay someone enough or they just simply don't know anybody, that's when they start looking at resumes. Right. Like to me, like that's the order. And mm-hmm. so you have to find a way to get in that order the highest you can with as many people as possible. You know, my story quickly is, again, I transferred to McPherson College up in Kansas, which is about 10 minutes south of Salina, Kansas. During the time when I was playing, the JUCO National Tournament for Women's Basketball was in Salina, Kansas. For men's basketball, it's always been in Hutchison, Kansas. But for the women at that time, it was in Salina. It was over my spring break. The rest of my teammates went to Padre. I was the only person on campus at McPherson College. And I drove to Salina every day, 8 a.m. and was there till 8 p.m. and watched every JUCO Nationals Women's Basketball game. The only people in the stands, college basketball coaches. For real. Mm-hmm. Like, like, like you've been, you were a JUCO player. Like at Nationals, like there was like 25 parents and then college coaches. That's it. Yeah. Um, and so like there was 500 people there, 470 of them were college coaches of all levels. And like, to be honest with you, like they needed players. So they were there for a reason. And so between each game, I would sit next to a different coach. And like literally, like there'd be a 45 minute waiting period, you know, from from after game to the next game. And I would sit down with a different coach and I would say, hey, um, this is who I am. I'm looking into getting into women's college basketball. How did you get in? Straight up ask them their story. And then the second piece was, are there any words of wisdom that you could give me? And I only asked two questions. And what I realized, you know, as you and I talk right now is people, especially division one basketball coaches, all have an ego to some extent and love talking about themselves. So my instinct was I want them to talk about themselves before I talk about me. Mm. And so that's my first question. So throughout that week, I met a ton of college coaches and happened to talk to the right person at the right time. It was the head coach in northern Colorado, Jamie White. And at the end of that conversation, she said, Eric, I drove from Colorado to Kansas today and my athletic director called and said, you can hire a GA for the first time in school history. That that morning, she got that call from her AD and she said, hey, send me your resume and we'll talk throughout the week. We talked the next two days and on the fourth day it was a semifinal. The day before she said, hey, um, let's go to Chili's before this game. And like after this game, I'm driving back. And so Chili's we talked for like two hours. I didn't even realize it was an interview. So we just were kind of shooting the bull. Like I thought that we were just having a conversation and it turned out it was an interview. Um, about a month and a half later, I drove out to Greeley, Colorado, met their entire staff and was hired on as their GA. Um, the funny added to that story is the next day she resigned, um, which is wild in itself. But in the positive way, she resigned because she accepted the head coaching job at Fresno State. Um, so time goes on. She calls me about two months later and says, I'm the GA at Fresno State. You will move to California. And there I am, California, about a month later, June 1. Um, so that was my basis of getting in the door was to have me right place, right time. But I put myself in the right place, right time to meet head coaches and college coaches um, at Juco Nationals, where they're sitting there watching basketball in between games, doing nothing outside of sitting on their phone. So they had access to time. Um, after my first year as a GA at Fresno State, I realized that I needed a job after you too. Like for real, like after the year two as a GA, I'm gonna need a full-time GA because I need to pay some bills uh, and my student loans from UC Tyler and McPherson College. <laughs> so at, during that summer, you know, July recruiting, all my coaches were gone. So I started emailing everyone that I could, you know, thinking like, you know, as coaches are traveling to events, they can just get on the phone while they're driving in a car or at the airport or whatever. So I was emailing coaches like crazy and I wasn't getting a ton of feedback back, 
Like I always tell people probably 30% of coaches that I emailed got back to me, which is not a bad number, but I was like, man, like how can I get access to more people consistently? And I literally took what I was emailing to these college coaches and started doing handwritten letters with the same exact stuff. And it was super simple. He, I'm Eric Drew, graduate assistant at Fresno State. Um, my Literally what I hit them with was like a stat about their team. So if you were top 25 in any stat category in women's basketball that year, you got an email or you got a handwritten letter from me. If you were number five in total rebounds, you got it. You got a letter from me. And if you were top 25 in three different categories, I hit I hit you with all three of them. And I like I was like, hey, I was like, if you were X, Y, and Z in these stats, I would love to talk to you about how you develop your team in that category. Second question: mm. I'm looking to stay in women's basketball. I would love to hear your story about how you got in. Um, and then here's my business card. I, I can be free whenever you you want to reach out to me. Um, and then I had a notebook with me at all times, and I wrote down every coach that I handwritten, I wrote a letter to, and what questions I asked them. So, like, if I was literally walking from a class, I would have that notebook in my backpack if someone cold called me. And literally, Sherry Cole from Oklahoma cold called me. Jeff Walls from Louisville cold called me. Um, middle of nowhere, walking from class, and I literally pulled out my mo- notebook to figure out what questions I asked them, um, just to make sure I was on point. I wasn't just making stuff up. Um, literally met a ton of people and I wasn't just division one. So at the time I was like, I'm going to need a job. So it was D one, D two, D three, NAI, JUCO. If you were good, you got a handwritten letter for me. And I probably sent 250 handwritten letters that summer and talked to 120 plus people. And it really went from 30% on email to 60 to 70% response rate on handwritten letters. Um, so that was like my niche. Well, I wrote a handwritten letter to the new head coach at UT Tyler. Her name was Kendra Hassel. She had just gotten the job. So I wrote her a handwritten letter and we had some email exchange back and forth. We had one phone call, and I thought that was basically it. Um, that summer, or summer, um, at the end of the season, we went to the Final Four, and we just happened to run into each other, had another conversation at the Final Four, and she literally said, hey, if you ever need anything, just give me a shout. Month goes by, a position at ACU opens up. I call her at 530 in the morning. And I said, hey, I saw Matt Stein left to go take a job in Northern Kentucky. Um, what do you know about ACU? And I say that because she had come from ACU. She was the associate head coach prior to taking the job at UT Tyler. Mm. And so I knew she had a connection there. And she was like, Eric, she's like, send your resume and I'll get you an interview. And literally two days later, I am have, have a phone interview with Coach Julie Goodenough. Um, and about a week after that, I was in Abilene accepting the job. What I found out is Kendra Hassel was the Division Three Player of the Year for Coach Goodenough when she played at Harden-Simmons and had been at, an assistant at every stop that Coach Goodenough was at. So like when you and they're now best friends. Um, so like when your best friend says hire somebody, they hire him. And at the time, she didn't like her candidate pool. So when your best friend says, I trust this guy, you should hire him. It was a done deal like that. Right. Um, so I had no idea that a D3 head coach would give me a division one assistant job at 24 years old, or 23 years old. Um, but that's how it operated. And I was super fortunate. Um, and here I am still to this day. And I love every bit about it. But that's all. I'm sorry, that probably took up way too much time. Um, but it, there's a lot of tidbits in there of it doesn't matter what level, it doesn't matter who you reach out to. You never know who could be your next connection to a job um, in the college um, sports world for sure. Oh, my goodness. No, no, that that story needed to be shared. That was so good. Coach Daru, that was so good, man. So what what I just took away from what you said is one. the first thing going back is you're saying that we have to do things that everybody's not willing to do. You sacrifice spring break. I believe it was sure. when everybody was partying and everybody's having fun, but you're like, no, it's time for me to position myself for my career. Then you got past, you know, talking to people that you didn't know because that, that right there can be a challenge that I'm sure many people yep. allow to stop them. And then even though it would have been easy for you to attempt to try to sell yourself, because I know how that goes. It's it's easy to try to do that first, because in our mind, it's like, OK, if I sell myself, then I want to know more about me. But you flip the script and you say, well, let me ask the question and let me get them talking and then they'll just talk. But the handwritten letters, the handwritten letters was a gem. Yeah. But you said handwritten letters with a stat from the individual team. That is a true game change. That's like a that's like a perfect trifecta because the handwritten letter, man, that I, I'm sure your hand was cramping after you wrote all them letters. It was three a day, but, but I kept myself to it. I wrote three letters a day and it was every morning. That's the first thing I did when I got to the office. Oh, oh, 
Oh. And, so, and so, so, so it wasn't pushing anything crazy, but I, but I kept myself true to myself. Like I knew that I could do three levers a day and not overdo it. Um, mm. and, and going back to like, you know, people like talking about themselves, egos, college coaches, we all have one to some degree. What I realized is one, if I asked about their career, they'll talk about it. But two, if you were, if you're a college basketball coach and your team was good at something, you want to talk about it. So when you're talking about that, that's what goes back to the stats is like, I was talking to coaches who had bad seasons, but they were the top five team in the country in free throws. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like, yeah, that coach like didn't have an amazing year, but they were really good in something. So at least they can talk to somebody about their positive thing. So I wasn't talking to every dominant division one program in the country. It was, I was the top to bottom. Um, And you just never know who you could help. Oh my goodness. That's so, there's so much, like there's so much in what you just unpacked, even though you said doing the three a day wasn't anything crazy. I'm going to say it was. And the only reason I'm going to say that is because the level of consistency to do that for three a day, even when you're not getting some responses back, when you're not getting the call back for the span of three days, five days, seven days, when you didn't get a call, but you were also always ready with the notebook, ready to look, okay, wait a minute. Okay. This person called you, you continue to persevere through the process. Oh, that's good, man. Yeah. <laughs> oh man that that's so that's so good that that's so good so with with so, okay so now now stuff is starting to connect for me so i want to talk with you now about about the tiktok yeah. because i've seen your consistency on tiktok talk, just because because i like i know you shared a little bit earlier about you know you finding your niche on tiktok but how did how did you come to this because the platform was overwhelming for me Right. And you've seen I'm I'm, I'm still a, a struggling TikToker currently. So just man, just 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 talk a little bit about that. You know, I, I was fortunate, to be honest with you, like my first post on TikTok was mid COVID. I had nothing to do. I was bored out of my mind and I needed something. Right. And I saw TikTok and I kept I don't know how much you follow Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V. Um, but mm-hmm. he's something that like I've learned a ton from him and how to brand and create content. And I probably started five months later than I should have on TikTok, but I was fortunate. My, my first video was the top three things I look for in a point guard. And it got 150,000 views in two days. And if it wouldn't have done that, I probably would have scrapped TikTok forever. But because like I'm on Twitter all the time and I have a decent following on Twitter and I, I put out decent content on Twitter on a daily basis. But when TikTok hit 150,000 views, in my first video, I knew that there was something different about the platform and the ability to get organic reach to p- people that want the content that I'm putting out. Like on mm-hmm. Twitter, if I put out good content, my people see it. Mm-hmm. And like if they retweet it, then maybe a new branch sees it. Where like with TikTok, if someone watches my video all the way through because they like basketball, then that TikTok is going to send it to the next person that likes basketball and the next one, if they keep watching it and it expands so rapidly. So if, if the first one wouldn't have blown up like that, I would have probably still slightly dabbled in it. But the second it hit, I was like, hold on, this is something different and I need to find my place here. And for the longest time, no one was doing what I was doing in my space and that my space as in recruiting basketball player development, um, recruiting tips and like my first like 25 videos were like only point guards and like people were berating me because I wasn't talking about shooting guards or centers or power forwards but like at the time I was like I'm gonna only hit on like what I know no and I'm our point guards coach here and I had just graduated the Southland player of the year four-year starter record like all-time winningest player at ACU and like she was my point guard and so I had a huge connection with her and I learned a ton from her probably more than she learned from me and so, like, I was posting content basically about her um, just in generalistic form. Um, mm-hmm. but it was like I was posting what I knew and I, what I feel like I was had master knowledge. In. And master is probably too high of level. But, like, I feel like I was giving something then. And I've definitely expanded now that I started to understand what people are really looking for. And it's more about a little bit player development, but more about the recruiting process that people just don't know. And so I get more mm-hmm. questions about recruiting than anything else. And again, it's because college coaches hide behind whatever facade that we can't share information, which is wrong, uh, which I think we should be spitting more information to give people a clear point of view about recruiting. Um, but that was my basis of TikTok. And now it's, you know, my goal every day is to, for one a day, um, not goal, 
my bare minimum is I need to post a TikTok a day just to stay relevant. Um, I really need to be at three to four, um, but I, but I want to make sure I'm putting out good content, good quality content more than just content. How, how did you come up with that ratio, though? Just because, I mean, with with like, like with everything else that you do, with you being a father, you being a husband, and I mean, in addition to you also being a, a coach, a Division yeah. One coach, but how, like, how did you come to this this ratio to where you're like, I, I I should be putting out, you know, three to four pieces versus, you know, at least just bare minimum of one. Yeah, you know, what, I, what I have seen on TikTok is like you have to play with the algorithm um, and the algorithm pumps out obviously quality content and you have to figure out the music, what music's hitting that day and what music's uh, that week, I guess, um, how long of a video needs to be. And they all kind of change. So, like the more you post, the more that you feel your algorithm, because I feel on TikTok, it's person to person more than it is like a whole thing. Cause if, if everyone went viral every day because of one specific algorithm, people would figure it out pretty quickly. So I feel like I have a different algorithm than you, than somebody else. I think TikTok's as advanced as that. Um, so I think the more you post, the more you understand it. Like I know that when I post at 11 AM, I'm going to get less views than if I post at four. Um, so I post a ton of mine in the afternoon. Um, unless I'm just like in the morning when I get one out, but I have a ton of videos in my drafts that I save for the afternoon. Um, but I know because my audience is 14 to 18 year olds. Well, they get mm -hmm. out of school after four. Right. And so like I've pushed mine way later because all my kids, all, all my kids, all the people that I'm speaking to have some type of obligation from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, and I have to think about West Coast stuff and whatever. So like, you know, obviously you have to find your niche and your algorithm um, to be to be your best um, at getting the most views because the more views you get early, the more people it pumps to. Um, so if I post at 9 a.m. on a Monday on a school day, I'm going to get very few views. Even if kids randomly scrolling, sitting on class, they can't sit there and watch my entire video because they're in class because they can't hear me talk. So they can see it. But if they scroll after three seconds because they can't hear it, it shoots my algorithm down. Um, so I have to like find my own niche in time, too. Um, and again, like the content, the, the amount of content it's based off, again, the TikTok algorithm, algorithm but the fact of the more content, the better, because you don't you never know which one's actually going to hit um, um, the biggest pool. Um, but I just try to put out stuff that intrigues me and or at this point, what people ask me, because what people ask me is, is what they want to hear and what they want to know about. So I try to answer as many questions as I can. So the most followed women's basketball coach on TikTok, how, how do you know that? Like, how do you know that you're the I most research. followed? I, I, I research. There, there's an assistant at Quinnipiac who has like 35,000. Um, but other than that, like, you know, hashtags are huge on TikTok and hashtags push in one one direction or the other. Like for the longest time, like I was putting F FYP for you page until I realized that was just putting that for no reason. And I started dabbling with different um, hashtags, recruiting, recruiting tips, recruiting advice, um, all different genres of basketball stuff. And if you look at all those different hashtags, uh, my videos are at the top of all of them because I've hit them enough times um but yeah. what i've realized with women's basketball is there's only so many hashtags that you can use in basketball in the college coaching world and so i've looked at every hashtag and found every coach that's posting ever and i'll be respectful no one's close to me in follower count but <laughs> it, it, but it's because they, the college coaches haven't figured out how to use tiktok yet they think that dancing and doing the trend is what's funny and great what they didn't realize is no one's getting on TikTok to watch a 40 year old male dance on TikTok, right? <laughs> but they'll listen to a 55 year old guy talk about basketball if that's going to help them get better. Because mm -hmm. TikTok and any social media is about they're either getting education or entertainment, right? And I'm not entertaining at all, but I promise you I can educate you on something if that's what you want to hear. It's like I really don't care about how many followers I get. It's about the people that follow me wanting what I'm offering. Because I can't have millions of followers. I can't. I don't talk about a broad enough subject. You know, like hmm. we have 65,000. Like there's only a million people that play basketball in the States, you know, give or take, you know, that number. But yeah. like like high school basketball, there's a couple million. And so like not all, all of them don't have TikTok. Not all of them have seen my content yet. So like I, I knew my niche was small enough that I can't have a huge reach, even though like I'm going to do my best to have the biggest that I can. Man, you sitting there giving us like a TikTok masterclass. This is wild, man. Because you just hearing what you shared, I'm like, oh wow, there's some stuff I could be doing differently. Oh, 
back to the drawing board back mm -hmm. to the drawing board so with, with with name image and likeness getting ready to come up and you know by the time we drop this episode it's, it's gonna be it's gonna be live and and well man you just really hit on TikTok really really heavy masterclass worthy definitely masterclass worthy um so thinking about that and just seeing how how you've been able to leverage the platform and how, how you've been able to grow your your following and just showing your expertise via TikTok. And name, image, and likeness is rolling out, okay? Do you feel that there is a benefit for student athletes to be able to leverage the platform uh, to win with name, image, and likeness? I couldn't have asked for a better application on a phone than TikTok during this timeline of name, image, and likeness. Mm -hmm. I say that because before this, Instagram is good. Twitter is good, not great, especially for a college athlete. And I say that before I hit on name, image, and likeness. Every athlete, high school kid, whatever is on Instagram, right? They all have a Twitter, but they don't post organically on it. Most most people are still posting organically on Instagram whenever they go to the beach or where they have a, a nice picture they're posting. But on Twitter, people are liking and retweeting, but they're not creating organic content. Where on TikTok, you can create organic content every day and the algorithm gives you new things to do, new dances, new videos, new whatever trends and it's constantly coming we're on instagram and twitter it's not as freely with the trends and so mm -hmm. it's just perfect timing with name image and likeness to have TikTok as an app that can organically reach millions of people for no reason right because other apps can't, don't have the ability to do that therefore you have had like to make money off of instagram you literally have to have a following a legit following who wants to follow you because of your name we're mm -hmm. on TikTok. They can follow you based off your entertainment, based off your education. And it doesn't matter if you're good looking or not. Um, even though if you're good looking, it might get you farther in one genre. But like, I'm not that good looking and I get far enough in my educational um, piece that enough people want to follow me, right? Like, I don't know. I think it's perfect timing for this app to be the part of name, image, and likeness. I think it'll be the primary focus of the majority of athletes to profit early. Mm. Um, I think that some of the best um in college athletics that have built um, their own name on TikTok are doing a good job of pushing to YouTube because YouTube is obviously the second piece where it's easy access of profit. Once you get over a thousand followers, you can start making money, I believe. Um, so I think they're, everyone that's heavy on TikTok is doing a good job of pushing, pushing to YouTube just to have a secondary revenue. I think those are the two easiest platforms to build. YouTube's not easy to build. But the, the fact that you can build on TikTok and then merge them to YouTube with mm -hmm. long form videos, et cetera, I think is the way to go and the route that most should be taking. And then obviously you can spin off and, and get get with you and, and add a podcast. I think every not every, but I think a, a lot of college athletes would definitely benefit from a podcast and being able to use their voice in, in their own way. Right. I think what where college athletes and athletes 24 and younger struggle with is not not always creating organic thoughts but delivering their thoughts and putting them on paper or putting them in a video or writing them down or saying them out loud. I think a lot of people are hesitant on what other people will think. And once they actually put it out there, it's actually gets taken better than they'd ever expected. But don't, a lot of people don't have the confidence to do it just yet. And I'm hoping that name image and likeness pushes the confidence one step forward for people to try and people to dabble. There's a lot of college coaches that are really hesitant on name image and likeness but I want to be the first and foremost to be like, this is one of the greatest things for college athletics. I don't care that my players getting paid. I'm like, I'm like, I'm doing with whatever the NCAA tells me with my scholarships and my cost of attendance checks that we can give them. But I would do anything for my starting point guard, for my backup point guard, for the 14th person on my roster to make 20 extra dollars a month. Because I know what our kids make and I know how their parents are and I know their families and not all of them have the deepest bank accounts. And like you and I were talking about before the show, like, I make anywhere from 75 to 125 dollars a month on a consistent month and like i have a good salary here so like i'm not needing money from my TikTok page to pay my bills but like all i know is there's college athletes in non-revenue sports so like not basketball or football so like cross-country runners who are partial scholarship athletes that are paying out of pocket at division one universities mm. who run for that university to play tennis for that university to play softball that absolutely would love 75 extra dollars a month 125 extra dollars a month and you don't have to be the biggest name person at the biggest name university to do that 
Yeah, yeah, man, you just laid that thing out. You really laid that because you you had me even because ultimately. So let so I'm, I'm gonna take what you said. I'm just gonna reverse engineer mm-hmm. it. So let's say that there was a student athlete that created a podcast, right? Yep. Then let's say they learn how to edit the content. Yep. So now they have with that content, they can take that, make it a TikTok. They can take it, put the long form on YouTube yep. or even take that same piece short form, make it a YouTube short and then just just get the content working to build the to build the platform. And then ultimately through building the platform, one thing that I know is always big when we talk student athletes and we talk transition, that's going to help cultivate the identity. That's going to help them grow the network. That's going to hopefully, like you said, help them build the confidence and build the soft skills. So I think I, I think name, image, and likeness is going to do a lot more good than it would do harm. But I think there's a, there's a great opportunity to make sure that we are doing the education. It's a huge piece. It's a huge piece. And I, I think the biggest struggle at the university level is whose job is that? Mm. Right? It, because, because it's literally a brand new entity for, for the NCAA and for universities. It's whose obligation is it to make content, to help players, players, student athletes make content, to help teach them about podcasts, TikTok, YouTube, how to make profits, how to do brand deals. Like all of these things are coming into question fast, right? Really fast. And I think there's universities that are not ready for it, even though the questions are going to be coming quick. And and I think that's the biggest struggle early. Obviously, it's not going to get played out large scale yet because there's only six or seven states that have bought into like starting this, this summer, but it's coming quick to the masses. And I think you know, everyone's going to have a relatively level playing field as in the fact that anybody can be on it. Anyone can do it. It's going to be those that have the structured background that have a conversation with their athletes about this is what you should do. Because if you don't tell a, a student athlete or a traditional um, athlete how to create content for TikTok or YouTube or podcast show, they're going to be spending more time doing figuring out that than actually making content and or doing their own sport to be honest with you mm. because not every student athlete should be dancing on tiktok but what, what would kick on for a football player fo- kickers for football teams should be doing crazy kicks once a week right like crazy distance like this ridiculous stuff right like that would be phenomenal content for some people and then they should also talk about educating on how to be a better kicker and mm. how how their holder needs to hold the ball like it needs to be an educational piece it has to be some entertainment piece um they have the leverage more than I do. So the NCAA handcuffs me to a degree. I can't comment back to my, who that comment to me because it's, because it's, because it becomes a recruiting thing. So like I can't even comment back where a student athlete can comment back to anybody. So they can actually engage in their community more than I can. Wow. Like if somebody comments to me, like a traditional TikToker could take that comment or reply and make a video on top of that. Right. Like they can have that uh-huh. you know, piece of that comment in there. I can't do any of that where any student athlete can take any comment and make a video. And it just gives them more ability to make content and they just take comments and do that. Or you find a niche um, about you know, maybe you're in comedy and you love comedy or the biggest thing for college athletes is gear drop. We give our kids so much Nike gear, mm. literally show us what Nike gear and that blows up um, day in the life of a student athlete. People love that stuff. Like there's content that you can, make. but if someone's sitting there behind their back saying, this is a great idea for you. You should try this helping them. These student athletes, Again, like if you don't know, you don't know, and therefore you're just going to do whatever you see on your TikTok page, even though your algorithm might be different and what you're actually comfortable with might be significantly different of what you're actually watching every day. Man, that's that's so good, especially especially a day in a life. So I'm, I'm just going to I'm just going to share this with you. I mean, I've, I've said it. I've said it on, online many times, but I, I, I think just going back. So going back to the, the, the analogy or the situation we created. Right. So we'll say they create the podcast, Mm -hmm. then they chop up the content, they put it on TikTok, they put it on YouTube. And then let's say the following begins to build. Yeah. If they print off 20 t-shirts and they sell those shirts for $20 each, that's $400. Yeah. And that's that's easily that that's that's easily a that's that's nice pocket change. And then let's say they do it again. Oh. Man, you 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 give me you give me excited. You you give me excited. I'm just gonna stop. You give me excited. 
the opportunity there, man. And, and, and it's right. And, and it's what college athletics should be. Yes, they're amateur athletes to, to whatever extent we want to talk about that. Um, but let's be honest. If you're not men's basketball, women's basketball, and you're getting a high scholarship, you need to have the ability to do something else. Because I, I would I would argue that college athletes are full-time people. As in, they're giving their full time to their academics and their sports. And that takes a ton of time. I know you worked in college to some degree. I didn't have to. Like, my parents paid a ton of my bills, and I'm super fortunate for that. Um, but again, like, it's not easy to find a job while being a college athlete and going to no. class. And so if you can be able to make pocket change and or like, let's be like $400 would have been nice to anybody. Like I want to think big form. I had no money to invest in the stock market. And if you want to go mm. cryptocurrency right now, which is the hot topic. If mm. I had $400 in, in pocket, I was a men's or women's basketball player at division one. So my housing, my room and board, my meals are all already paid for. So like anything that I make off of TikTok, YouTube, uh, my brand is extra money. I would love for universities to do a better job of teaching financial literacy in the fact that like the difference between someone investing at 18 and investing at 25 could be hundreds of thousands of dollars, even if it's just a hundred dollars a month, right? Mm -hmm. With compounding interest and mutual funds and, and then cryptocurrency again, it's just crazy in itself and not gambling. And not putting like, you know, $100 on a crazy stock that you think is going to balance. I'm talking about like traditional financial literacy. The difference between five and seven years of investing is a game changer for your life. That's not talked about enough. But to me, like that's where like I would love if you were getting everything paid for, like football and basketball players at the Division One level, what are you doing with that extra money? Mm. And, like, again, like you do not setting someone else up for after their life. Like, like that you try to do on a consistent basis. To me, that's where it's at with the extra money. If you're in that opportunity of everything else is paid for, like all of my athletes are, I would love for them to put $200 a month into a Roth IRA and learn about a Roth IRA and have yeah. four to five extra years to do that instead of finding out what a mutual fund is and an IRA is after you get a full-time job at 24, right? Mm -hmm. Like those four to six years is a game changer in the compounding interest game. I know it's, we took that way off topic, um, no, but no, we're, we're, think, on like, topic. we're on topic. <laughs> but like, I, but I think, but I think that's the move stacked on top of name, image, and likeness that universities need to figure out fast. Man, man, so so good, so good. I'm, I'm, about, I'm about to let you get out of here in a second. I'm about to let you get out of here in a second. But we're about to we're about to make a slight transition. Gonna make a slight pivot. OK, and we're going to uh, we're, we're going to jump into uh, what I like to call the two minute drill. Yep. And and the two minute drill for if anybody, if you're out there and you're watching for the first time, first and foremost, make sure you subscribe to YouTube. Make sure you subscribe, because just like Coach DeRue said, we're on a mission to get our thousand subscribers. But you need a thousand subscribers. And I think it's like four thousand hours watch time. Yeah. But yeah. So so we're, we're on a mission. So make sure you subscribe to the to the platform. Um, but two minute drill is where. You're, I'm going to ask some rapid fire questions to Coach Daru, and you're going to see a slightly different angle, just going to lighten things up a little bit. So, Coach Daru, are you ready? Let's do it. All right. All right. Here we go. Favorite food? Man, I like pizza. Like, for real. I can, I can eat a slice of pizza every day. Okay. Okay. What, what's, what's the last book you read? Last book I read? Oh, Damon Johns from the Shark Tank, Rise and Grind. Okay. Okay. What's the most underrated cereal? Oh, Lucky Charms. Hmm. Yeah. 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 That, that, that's a good one. That's a good one. What's your go-to streaming show of preference? Shark Tank. I love entrepreneurship, even though I'm not an entrepreneur. I mean, you 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 you're, you're getting I into dabble. it. I dabble. You're, you're getting into it. Yeah. Yeah. You get into it. And then what's what's one tip that you want to leave for a student athlete? Be genuine. Be who you are. Um, be transparent and honest at all times. At the end of the day, like we just talked about name, image, likeness a ton. If, if that's not you, so be it. Um, but always be you. If that's the one that you want to be, just put yourself out there on a podcast, on YouTube, on TikTok, then be it. And don't worry about what other people think. You know, as a personal, as a college athlete myself, um, to whatever extent I was, I think as a college student, people are so worried about other people's, like how they think of them and how like, I, I guess that thought process where once I got married and had a kid and I just operate my day every single day, I honestly don't care what other people think about me. And that's not like a degrading way. And I don't treat people poorly. It's I've got my myself to 
living on my own core values. My core values are I take care of my family, like stability and financially, like that's one. Um, two, win basketball games. And three is my faith. If it doesn't operate in my three core values, I don't do it straight up. And, and I, it, ta- it took me a long time to get there. And I probably should, I maybe should have done it when I was in college. It took me a long time to figure this out. Um, but I used to do so much extracurricular that actually didn't impact me to be a better person. And so I want people to be genuine to who they are. And again, my, my core values are taking care of my family, stability, financially, whatever it is, winning basketball games, because if you win basketball games, I'm taking care of my family long term um, because I'll always have a job and three your faith. Um, and again, I, you know, I'm a faith person. I work at a Christian university. And I get to talk about faith every day. You know, faith is whatever you want it to be. You know, I'm I, I love people and I love who people are. And there's a lot of things in the Christian faith that don't align always with different things, um, with how some people view the world today. But I want people to love others. And as long as you love yourself, you can love anybody freely. Um, I hate hate. There's no reason to hate somebody. Uh, there's no reason to dislike somebody. So as long as you're genuine to you and you can love somebody else, I think you'll live a pretty happy life. Spot on, spot on. And then who's one guest that you'd like to see me interview on Beyond the Ball next? Um, R2 from uh, YouTube. Um, if you follow R2 Basketball on TikTok and YouTube, he's an interesting um, developer of basketball players. And he has a very interesting mind um, when it comes to developing and players and their life beyond basketball. He's super interesting. has a, obviously a huge following, um, but really – interesting human being um, that that wants to help others all right all right well there it is there it is and coach deru let people know where they can find you follow you and connect with you yep eric deru acu i don't know yep eric deru acu that's the same thing on all platforms twitter tiktok instagram um if you can type that in you can find me my dms are always open always to anybody as long as it's not a recruiting issue or compliance issue i'll answer back as much as i can um that's where i'm found I can answer as many questions as I can on TikTok, especially in video format, um, but that's where I can be found. My man, Coach Daru, man, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of you. I'm excited for you. And thank you so much for stopping by and, man, just adding massive value. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, ballers, if you have not connected with Coach Daru, you want to make sure to find him at Eric, E R I K. D-E-R-O-O-A-C-U, just to make sure that we all have the have the correct spelling. So make sure to follow him and connect with him on Twitter as well as on, on TikTok as well. He puts out phenomenal content. And uh, if you're looking to figure out your way through the recruiting process or even to get some tidbits, make sure to follow and connect with him there. And as always, make sure you subscribe. Make sure you subscribe and share with a friend. But in addition to that, I want you all just to know that my DMs are also open. Feel free to send in an episode, topic idea, or whatever it might be, and I'll make sure to tag you, and I'll make sure to shout you out on the platform. But I'm Jonathan Jones, and this is Beyond the Ball, where we help you succeed beyond your degree.